This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote ideas to the meaning of the word? God, I wish it would have started with Bitcoin. Bitcoin. What about Bitcoin? I drove by a truck the other day. I think it was like a construction truck or something, but BTC was the logo on the side. And I was like, they're hauling Bitcoins around. <laughs> nice. They were physical the whole time. Was there like armed security guards around? No. They were non-fungible security. I mean, you couldn't possibly steal this. No. I mean, could you imagine the gas fees on a whole truckload? Dude. <laughs> oh. Never going to forget em. that. I still don't know what gas fees are. It's a transaction fee for it taking place on the network, I think. I thought it was like when you pay tax for unleaded kind gasoline. Of. Gas is not yeah. cheap. What is it there? It's over $5. Jesus. Yeah. No. Yeah. So if I keep drive like an, too, if I drive an hour out of town, it's like three. Yeah. We got it for 309 yesterday. I spy an arbitrage opportunity for you. I know, right? Hauling Do gas it. back and forth from the mountains. Do it. You won't. I won't. You're right. <laughs> Uh, you probably get a lot of gas and some containers in the back seat of your Mustang. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that won't go terribly wrong. <laughs> I'm sure if I were to be stopped, they would love to know what transporting that much gas. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them NFTs are expensive, man. Oh, yeah, true. I rarely see cops up there on that road. That's why I, I go fast. Ricky 100, Bobby. 100 fast. Yeah, I am like Ricky Bobby. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. 100 what? MPH. You have to be specific because people who don't live in America listen to kilometers this. per hour. There we go. Isn't that, Isn't that pretty slower? slow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited to go to Amsterdam and just get numbers wrong for a week and then come home. Yeah, it'll yeah. be it'll be fun. Isn't I can't it believe it's only a few weeks away. Th- three weeks? Yeah. Two, right? It's like two weeks, 15 days or something. Woo! In two weeks, you can start working on your talk. Hopefully. I'll be able to work on it after the keynote, <laughs> the first keynote. You can do it on the plane ride that we have for infinity amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Shannon's going. She's like, I'm going to sleep, yada, yada. And I was like, by the time we land, it'll only be like one o'clock back home. Like, there's no way I'm going to sleep. I'm just going to push through. It's usually easiest for the rest of the days there, too, if you just push through. That's my plan. I think we arrive at like... Seven or eight in the morning, just be like a day and a half awake. Not too bad. Done it before. Yeah. Without even leaving your apartment, I'm sure. Did it last week, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what have you guys been doing this week as usual? All but bats. like, it's Monday. Yeah. It's so this, weird. I've been in calls all day. I've been oh, calling yeah? back. Meeting Monday? Meeting Monday. Monday. I usually have two or three back-to-backs Monday morning, but... Do you guys I, actually stand back to back and then talk to each other? Yeah, with Andrew our and hands I, and like a that pistol. How it goes. Yeah. Andrew and I have only looked at each other during these recordings. Most of the time, we just see the other parts of our rooms. Yeah, you have to have your back to the computer on a Zoom call like that. Let me tell you that either this option existed a year and a half, two years ago, and I didn't know, or Stripe has listened because Andrew, you I haven't talked to you about this either. And you were part of checkout. So when we built part, our checkout, put in this out of my mind, when we built checkout, we started using the new payment element at Podia clarification. And in order for us to render the payment element, you had to create a payment intent. That was the thing you had yeah. to do, except now you can render it without a payment intent. You can give it really. Yes. So you can give it, an amount and a currency. And then as part of the workflow, Andrew is about to throw his chair through the window. When you go to submit the form, then you make an Ajax request to create the payment intent server side, like just in time, get the client secret back and pass the client secret to the confirmed payment call. And then that will trigger SCA, 3D secure, all those things so that you still don't have to do the old school back and forth between the server, which was touchy which was rough that's why even with the limitation that you had to create a payment intent before it was still better but now it's even better and so my week is about to be oh that's super nice yeah i know about that that's really cool i know that last week they said you can make payments for zero dollars now which is like super handy 
that was just like an annoying thing where it was like, I got to build Andrew another die. workaround. Yeah. I remember hitting that. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't have a way to do this in Stripe. So I got to build a workaround and like a, a fake charge or something for a free purchase. And that always sucked. So it was like really nice to be like, yeah, you go through the regular checkout process and it can be $0 and you don't need to put in yep. a element or whatever. I've also been testing their embedded Stripe checkout where you can put it just in line on your page, which is cool. That is a nice What's update. The lift on that? Because I have the beta for job board, but I haven't done it yet. The it's lift? a lot of work. It's like, a lot of work. No, no. You got to specify a special API version on the back end and on the front end. And then as long as your account's like in the beta. And then originally you could not supply a success and return URL. I think you can supply a return URL now, but the checkout session call is exactly the same, except for you set UI mode to like embedded. And then okay. you had to remove the success and return, but I think the return or one of them is still there. And then you set up when it's finished, a callback in the JavaScript instead of letting them redirect the user to the return URL or the success URL, there's a success callback and then you can do whatever the heck you want with that, which is nice. So you can verify the payment intent or whatever setup intent on the front end and then choose to reset or retry or send forward them along with turbo or whatever you want to do. So it's like cool. virtually no code changes from my test on things. And I assume they're working on dark mode support at some point. That will be, I'm sure, a thing that they need to do. But other than that, it's just like the full UI. So you can input your address, you can input any of the same exact things. It's got the same two column layout, everything, just drop it in your blank page on your application and voila, you're good to go. And it looks basically like checkout, but you got your own header and footer on it basically. So I like it. It looks great. Yeah. It's been on my to-do list, but it keeps falling further down. I need to just do it. Yeah. I'm curious how long it'll take to get out of the private beta that it's in right now into like a public or final release. But yeah, I think we'll probably switch to using that on Go Rails instead of the redirect. It's just nicer to stay on site. And I sure as hell don't need all the payment element stuff. I just want to collect your address and your sales tax and all that and in one and not have to write any code to do that myself. So I'm uh, pretty happy with that. Plus you get all like promo code form, the sales tax, the ability to like edit your quantities and all that. Like if you have to do all that yourself, it's quite a bit of work. So drop in a one liner to mount the embedded checkout is like ace. Love it. You know what else happened since we last recorded? Was it the beta of Rails 7.1 that dropped with a lot of good stuff? Yeah, some really awesome stuff. I'm in the middle of recording a whole bunch of videos on the different features and changes and things. Long list of stuff. Your authentication video with the new Rails 7.1 authentication goodies did really well with the people. Yeah, I saw DHH retweeted it and Raphael... Some TypeScript guy. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, yeah, it's a funny story. I was talking to Raphael at RailsConf back in, what was that, May? April? Mm -hmm. And was telling him about, you know, I thought the normalizes and all the authentication features were really awesome. And I was going to put together a video showing how to build authentication from scratch as DHH recommends and use all those new features and stuff. And so right after RailsConf, I recorded that video and sent it to Raphael. And he was like, it'd be cool to include that in the notes and stuff. So it might end up in some of the release notes as an example of putting it all together. Because there's some cool stuff like how secure password got timing attack sort of prevention so that when you like previously would do it, you would do a user find by email and then if that user didn't exist, it would just like return right away unless, you know, wrote your own code to evaluate it in the same rough time that it would take otherwise. And so 
it can help make that simple so you don't have to worry about the timing attack stuff. You just call user, authenticate by, log in like your username or email address and the password. But that same how secure password will also generate a password challenge field now. So when you're updating your profile, you can say like, here's my current password. I'll go in your password challenge in your params. And you can use the with defaults to reverse merge in the password challenge. So if somebody was editing their profile and just like deleted that input field out of the form, they could get around that. So you put the with default in there. So there's always an empty string at a minimum, never skipping that field. And that will verify the old password before you update and change your new password and confirmation, make sure all those match and everything. So between those and the normalizes feature, which I think just about every Rails app I've ever written has some sort of normalize stripping white space characters or down casing like on emails. Between all three of those, authentication is like super slick now. So I'm super excited for just those real basic things. There's a whole ton of other things in the change log too. Yeah, I fired up a 7.1 beta app this weekend and it's jarring now that there's a Docker file and a Docker ignore. I can't remember what happened with their example in the change log has like, you know, Docker run, dash dash RM, dash IT, dash V, yada, yada, like the whole list of ridiculous amount of flags you got to pass it. I can't remember. I assume that this is all so going to work with the like docked rails repo. You remember that where it was kind of like an alias for this so that it would make it so you didn't have to run and remember all this super long command with the volumes and all that. My alias file used to be half Docker commands like this when I was working on Rails apps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't work on Rails apps anymore? I don't work on Docker Rails apps anymore. Something that's easy to miss that I don't think was listed in here that I remember seeing, but alongside the Docker stuff, there was the health check endpoint that's built in. Now, yeah. It's just super nice. Yeah. There's a route for it. It's usually Rails. It's like new. slash up yeah. or something. Speaking of routes... I didn't read into the PR, but there's a route Rails routes dash dash unused that you can find routes that are not used. I don't know the implementation. None of the really descriptions of that really explained what an unused route technically is, but I assume that it's like no action and no view. Didn't that already exist? I don't know. I mean, there's been stuff that's like two years old getting released in Rails okay. 1. So it's some of these hurt. things feel... Like they've already existed, but they've never been released publicly yet. I've definitely heard of this before a while ago. I'm going to look into that just to see like exactly how it works, but it should be pretty cool. The one thing on this that I dug into because I wasn't really sure what it all it was about was the async query stuff. Are you sure what it's about now? Well, I asked this question in Podia and Jamie answered me, but I basically was like, Could this create a scenario where your page renders without the promise finishing? Or does the promise have to finish? Like basically, like Stephanie and I were looking into this. When you call one of the async methods, you have to call dot value to actually have it block to get the value. So yeah, I think it would have to, as long as you call value. Otherwise, you're going to print out something that doesn't return the... You'll print out the promise thing instead. Right. Of okay. I the figured that out value. later. It was just kind of like confusing to me. Is like I don't know when I would use all of these because I was like in my brain What's I was like super async cool. Count. So imagine you're doing like a dashboard with a bunch of graphs. Yeah. You could have a query for every single graph and run those asynchronously. So some of those might be long, where it's like grabbing the last six months of checkout data or something, and you could right. do five of those or whatever at the same time. And then when it gets to the views, all of those should have been finished with the query and instantiating the objects or whatever, and then be able to just render out your graph or whatever. So in theory, it'll help with pages doing independent queries for rendering. So So, could be cool. one, One question that we had where Stephanie, our coworker, had, which I thought was really interesting. It was like, could you use this in theory to have just like an exact same scenario you have? We have all these graphs and all this data. And instead of 
doing what you just said, basically rendering the page and then using Turbo to like automatic, like when these resolve, using Turbo to like update it instead of waiting for them all to finish. Does that make sense? That's what I was trying to figure out where like the life cycle kind of is. I don't think that would make as much sense because if you're going to do that, well, I mean, those things are running in parallel. So they've got to like wait for it to finish at some point. Like in the view, it makes sense because they can be running. The first one can start rendering while the other ones are right. still querying and stuff. But if you're going to be like broadcasting stuff back in real time, then it's you could do that in background job or something. I would probably do that or gotcha. something else or a separate query HTTP request for those. Because at the end of the day, at least in your views, you still got to, if you're going to render all of that, in a view, you still got to wait for each one of them to finish before you right. can return a response. So if you really want to break that stuff up and load things separately, like turbo frames and separate requests that effectively are doing the same thing and just rendering a portion of the page would be still the way to go. But gotcha. I think dashboards are probably a pretty good example of that where it's like, we need to pluck the last hundred users, the hundred last charge subscriptions or charges or receipts or whatever that sort of activity yeah so the sequel can finish and the rest of the request can process as much as it can before yeah speaking of is this the first release that has the view locals magic comment in it i think it is you guys seen those no no you can put a little magic erb comment and that says like locals colon and a hash of your required uh, parameters. oh i did see that yeah, oh, yeah, yeah i did yeah. see that yeah so that's going to be kind of cool kind of like a teeny tiny improvement to kind of make a definition of required things that you know is a big reason why a lot of people like going to components because it's explicit we right. need these things and your locals can kind of enforce that now with the magic comment which is cool have the you guys thing, looked into Trilogy at all? A little bit. I haven't been able to find a good example of like, I know it's a modern version of MySQL 2, but what's better about it? I haven't found any good list of details. Trilogy avoids a dependency on the lib MariaDB slash lib MySQL client library, which can simplify gem installation and eliminate version mismatch issues and minimizes the number of times data must be copied in memory when building and parsing network packets. It, could, it should simplify gem installation and be more efficient under heavy query loads. Oh, very cool. I wonder if most of all that is in Ruby then, like no C extension? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't see any C extension stuff in the gem, which makes sense. And then probably MySQL 2 has a C extension. That's cool, though. That'll be a nice default to use for MySQL instead of, yeah, there's a C extension in there MySQL 2. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much send everybody to using Trilogy by default now, which is cool. And yeah, as far as I can tell, really the only change you would need to do is change your database URL protocol from MySQL 2 to Trilogy and swap the gems. Sweet. Yeah. It seems not super difficult, but although... Yeah, I don't know if there are like nuances to it of edge case things that you might do in one and not the other, but yeah. Seems good if you're going to be using MySQL on anything as a, remember, as a start. I remember having lots of issues in the past trying to install the MySQL 2 gem. To this day, like I just installed MySQL 2 on my MacBook a couple weeks ago and it was like, oh yeah, got to remember the like config options for homebrew and whatever. And it's, I think all that's gone, which is yeah. going to be amazing. It's just going to be like making everybody reminded that Trilogy exists and you should use it over MySQL 2 when there's been 20 years of MySQL 2 to like tutorials and recommendations and tutorials and everything else. So yeah, that might be the hard thing is just getting over the like, remember, if you see MySQL 2, try it with Trilogy instead. Yeah. I just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, HoneyBadger.io. Do you currently use one service for uptime monitoring, another for error tracking, another for status pages, and yet another to monitor your cron jobs and microservices? Paying for all of those services separately may be costing you more than you think. If you want to simplify your stack and lower your bills, it's time to check out Honey Badger. 
Honey Badger combines all of those services into one easy platform. It's everything you need to keep production healthy and your customers happy. Best of all, Honey Badger is free for small teams and setup takes as little as five minutes. Get started today at honeybadger.io. That's honeybadger.io. Does Rail 7.1 ship yes. with TypeScript? Perfect. Yep. No. Boom. Does Rail 7.1 ship with the common table expression stuff? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't even remember when sh- that came out. I know we don't have access to it in our code base and we're like on whatever the latest Rails 7.1 is. will have inbuilt support for common table expressions. Okay. And no. the so this signal is, blog. This is nice because we use a lot of common table expressions at Podia and we have to fall back typically to raw SQL to do it. So now, so a common table expression being that you want to maybe like kind of build up a query and you want to use some like sub tables to do it. And so now instead of having to write that SQL, you can say model dot with and name the common table expression and actually give it like active record. And then, yeah, then you can query from that. So I'm really excited about that because yeah, we use that a lot. Common table expressions are. So right now, do you use raw SQL snippets or something for that? Yeah. yeah active we record. Raw dog it. Oh, good God. Active raw dog record. My SQL. Active record base connection <laughs> dot execute. And then we throw in a here doc of SQL. It's my typical go to. Nice. I've had to nice. Edit those. <laughs> They're fun. There's something. They work. But yeah, I know this is good because we actually needed to do this recently. So this is good. Didn't you and I try to do this recently? I think you and I were the ones doing something with these and then we're like, oh, do we have access to this yet? No. Yeah, that sounds right. I distinctly remember you being there. I'm always there. In my heart. This is interesting. So like this is gonna be like a decently big release. It's huge. Yeah, There's it's like, like two years of work all coming out at once. Composite primary keys, this yeah. perform all later method and active job. That's something I didn't even yeah. realize I needed. And now I'm like, oh yeah, I definitely need that. That's yeah. like, I was thinking about that for using in notice because it's like, we got to go push one job after the other to notify all these users. And it's like, we could just generate them all, send them over. Yeah. And I think the implementation of the queue adapter can have like a bulk insert. So... It can do them all at once. And then in case something got interrupted, you wouldn't be like 30 in and the rest the last 100, you know, you know, don't get inserted or enqueued or whatever. So that seems like a really valuable little tiny, but extremely important feature. That's what this release feels like. It's just packed with stuff like that. There's tons of really good ones. My favorite authentication stuff that we haven't talked about yet is generates token four and it uses message verifier to generate a one-time use token that doesn't have to be stored in the database. So it's kind of like a sign global ID where you can just find the record based on the token without having to like save it in the database and go find on the column. You can do that. Plus when you give it a block, the example shows like using the first 10 characters of your password salt, it will encode that data in the token. So if you were to put your password salt in there or your email, whenever that gets actually used and updated, that's what makes it one time use. So when that value changes, it can't go look at your email address and use that old token because the emails don't match anymore. So it is freaking awesome to have that where it's effectively generating a one-time use token without any database stuff. So like your devised columns that used to have reset password token, confirmation token, yada, 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 all that stuff is gone. And it's like, we have a user and the user password digest and the email address. And that's pretty much all we really need, which is cool. Or maybe like an unconfirmed email and stuff, but none of the tokens need to really be there, which is awesome. I love this. I just I go ahead. I was gonna go say ahead. go ahead. This one thing left from perform all later, it does not run in queue callbacks. Oh that so makes it pushes, sense. Push mm-hmm. job on the queue at once without running in queue callbacks. Queue adapters may communicate the in queue status of each job by setting successfully in queued and or in queued error on the past in job instance. What makes it so performant is because yeah. it can bypass yeah. all that. I mean conceptually similar to like when we use bulk insert and stuff in active record 
it bypasses validations and callbacks because it just goes right directly to the database. Yep. I don't really care yet about bun, but I want to say that I think I do. Well, then we can talk about that after I finish this thought. I think it's really cool that JS bundling is like fulfilling its promise of like, okay, there's a whole new way to do this now and we can just tack it on and we don't have to change how we build assets or anything. It's just you swap out your build command. I think that yeah gives me some yeah. peace about where we are with assets right now. No, it's excellent. So Jason Muller made that PR last week and we use both of those gems. So I upgraded to that when Raphael released it and then it broke. And I was like, what's going on here? And both of those gems, he refactored it to have a build command method that would like make the ever growing if statement of here's the build command for tailwind and bun and yes, build and whatever bootstrap that's becoming hard to maintain. I think because it's like a generic library, but everybody wants shortcuts to pre-generate that stuff for them. As it turns out, this is just a weird thing about Rake that I never knew, and neither did Jason. So when we upgraded, I would run our deployments, and the CI would blow up, and I'd look at the logs, and it would just like run the JavaScript commands twice. And I was like, that's weird. And it turns out that all across all of your Rake files, any methods you define in those files are like in a shared namespace. And even if they're inside a namespace block, they are still globally available. If you define a method inside of a task, it is not. So that's weird and annoying. So I went and patched both the gems to put the methods in like a helper module that we just call. And then it's all nicely namespaced under CSS bundling and JS bundling build command. And that fixed it. And there's been a couple other like bug fix releases that looks like in the last few days too. But yeah, Rake is weird. I didn't realize that the methods were globally shared namespace across all that, even inside of the namespace blocks too. I thought maybe that scope would keep them safe in there, but they don't. So the other option is in Rake, you can actually define a class that includes Rake DSL. And then inside your initialize method or something, you can have it define the tasks which is even more abstraction that I didn't really want to do. But there are, I guess, ways around it. But it's just one of those weird things about how Rake evaluates stuff that doesn't feel intuitive to me, at least. Not what I expected, not what anybody really expected until you run into it and you're like, oh, that's odd. But it works great. All of these, like being able to insert X new tool into the pipeline is like, done you don't need any of his changes to do that he just made helpers to make it easy to add and get started with you could just already do that yourself by defining your own yarn script or whatever so it's pretty awesome to be able to dig into these things and see like wow this is now supports bun took some work to add the flags and options for everybody to use but you could just have used bun last week with no changes which is cool your boy was a little salty, though, because when JS bundling came out, back when it was still like ES build rails or whatever, I opened a PR to add like a config to it because like most of the time I use ES build, I inevitably end up needing to add like a plugin or something, which you can't do with the command line. Yeah. And my PR got shut down because there was a config, like no config. I think, I think enough of the other ones like bun has a config or something that probably now if you made that PR, it would be fine. But in the early oh. days, it was a trying to avoid that stuff, Jason. We don't Excuse want me those for files, one get- Jason. Sorry, I'm trying to get my work done. But yeah, I think moods have changed on that a bit because basically everything wants a dang config file. Yeah. Andrew, tell me why I want to use bun. It's way faster. Because it's venture backed. Nah, so I was looking at the graphs on like the bun website. And I was like, holy crap, this thing is so much faster. But I wrote like... It's wonderful. Wrote, <laughs> it's wonderfully fast. Rails has been using Yarn since I think Webpacker came out because yeah. Yarn used to be significantly faster. Now, recent versions of NPM have made that not quite the case anymore. But there's now it's gotten a lot more complicated because you have like Yarn 
Barry, I think, is still a thing. Yeah, Yarn, what, two and three yeah. exist, and Rails still kind of runs on Yarn they, one. We still, but you, most people use Yarn one, I think. Yeah, you can definitely use it with the newer Yarns, because we've had Hatchbox customers using Yarn two or three. Okay. And it apparently works, but I don't know. Yarn's adoption of two and three seems very like small compared to what it should be. And I remember NPM didn't resolve dependencies very well. And that was yeah. one of the major reasons why everybody switched to Yarn at the time. Cause it was like, yeah, it just does a terrible job installing things because it resolves stuff really weirdly. It wasn't reliable like Bundler, but that's all solved. I think that's right. all changed considerably. And in yes. NPM. Yeah, and I think NPM 7 was the one that made a great deal of performance improvements too. So I think at this point now, I think NPM is like slightly faster. But when I was, but the bun times were so different. That's why I was like, oh, I got to try this because I was thinking about it in the terms of like CI because I've been tweaking our CI stuff. Is bun like, time what they call runtime? Yeah, yeah, bun time. <laughs> yes. The bun time is way faster. And I feel like that's such a slow step that I see it coming up a lot. So that's why I was like, yeah, got to try this. If it speeds it up that much, it's a win for me. I'm fascinated by it because it's not only a package manager, but it's also the JavaScript TypeScript runtime. So it's trying to replace like Node and NPM as a single thing, which is interesting because you can use it as just a package manager or just a runtime, which is fascinating. So I'm curious to see what happens with it, but I know they raised money from investors and stuff. So I hope they have a reasonable path to making money or else we will be using Bun until somebody else does their cheaper version, however they plan to monetize Bun. But maybe they'll do something like Laravel where they got their own hosting thing that's paid or some service, but they can keep the core code and all that runtime and everything open source and free still fingers crossed but yeah, i'm definitely you, watching it i'm not ready to it? add it in now oh I, okay I, I don't think i've been right the second but i think that's it's what i'm nervous that, about well yeah i think i mean i'm nervous about that too i feel like i've just gotten to a point where i'm comfortable using javascript again after like we moved away from webpacker now that i'm like using yes build and stuff like i'm pretty happy and stuff doesn't break and now i'm like am i going to use this and all of a sudden i mean it's some obscure import error then i'm going to lose five hours because i'm using so bun so what's cool is jared sumner who was the core dev on bun he commented on my es build rails plugin for importing stimulus controllers and stuff and in es build and he's going to add the missing callbacks that the ES build plugins have to bun. He, he messaged that like a week ago and I, it was like shortly after bun 1.0 came out and I was like, you're on my package saying you're going to add compatibility to like make it easier to use this. What? So yeah, I, I'm impressed. I feel like it will be something I will check out. I don't know that it's going to necessarily be like a big enough difference going from ES build to bun, it hopefully is like interchangeable is what he wants it to be, especially if he finishes adding those like other arguments and, and options and stuff to make it compatible. Cause then we would be able to switch from ES build to bun and make no edits in theory, it sounds like. So then I'm like, okay, well, at that point, whatever's faster or better maintained, I'll just use either one of them. And hopefully they don't diverge on the long term does this mean that i can not need node on the server i deploy to yeah because you'd have bun which is a replacement for replacement node and yeah. yarn okay. yeah see i'm more so i'm way more in theory in that the would be part first yeah i'm curious to see how that compares to yarn i haven't really had any issues with yarn one but they're working on the new versions of yarn and i'm just ever getting further and further behind using that. So I'm kind of like, well, at some point I'm going to run into trouble and have to upgrade. And it's like I to address that earlier than running into a point where like, oh, guess what? You got to drop everything and go replace yarn on all of your projects or something. That would suck. So if Bun's as easy as it sounds like it will be to switch with his goal of 
making it ES build compatible, then yeah, why not? See, that's like way longer term, in my opinion. To me right now, I'm like, yeah, I would like to try the new bundler part of it first. Yeah. Not bundler, the new package manager part of it right, first. Right, right, right. Yeah. There was a lot of drama when Bun came out. I don't know if you saw that, but like people on like the node core team were like getting upset. Like it was wild. It was fun. I mean, they're throwing that bun out as a replacement for Node, so I'm sure that they feel, like, attacked by that. But also, like, it's a fire under their butts because I saw there's their buns under their buns. But it's a whole, like... I'm looking for the pun. It's been pushing people on the core team of Node to, like, let's optimize our file system stuff because it's slow and it could be way faster. And they've got a whole bunch of ideas already on how to improve that. So it's, like... Another one of those times where competition is good and encourages people to keep updating things that they may not have wanted to otherwise. We'll see. I'm somewhat skeptical when it's venture backed and we know that they have to make money off Bun somehow. So I'll be curious what happens with that. But if you're Ruby, You've got supporters like Shopify and other companies that are contributing to it. So maybe they end up with a similar kind of support system like that to keep the things going. It's just if they have investors that want to return on it now, it's not just trying to pay for sustainable salaries for the core team. It's like the investors want to return on their money. So curious what the long-term plan is there for that. I'm sure they've talked about that internally quite a bit. So we'll see. I don't remember if I was watching a stream or something, but somebody was talking about this and made the argument that like, this is obviously such a huge undertaking, a huge project that the only way somebody could sustainably compete with node is to get some type of funding. And I was like, that makes sense. I don't know where they go with it from here, but it makes sense if you're going to compete with the big dogs. Yeah. I mean, if you were to try and build another Ruby runtime right now, from scratch, you'd need a whole team of people working on it full time. I mean, it would be tough. There's a lot to catch up on and a lot of super smart people. You'd have to learn how they think about problems and like all the JIT stuff. There's been so many hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars invested in that stuff by all these established companies. So if you were to do that from scratch, yeah, you would need it, I would think. That's all I have today. Thank you, Stripe for fixing that freaking issue with it. Payment element. Yeah. 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 Now I got to go take a look at that because that sounds like a very helpful improvement because that was one of my annoyances because we were trying to collect the billing address, but in order to render, we needed to have a payment intent. And then it was like, if you fill out your billing address, like you would do in Stripe checkout, it would just show you the tax and the new amount but we'd have to go create another payment intent, then Mm re-render the form, recollect your payment method. And I was like, this is insane. So Podia checkout started as a full, like all the fields are there and we converted it to being like collapsed sections because of that. That's how we do it too. We didn't want you to put your card in and be like, I need to change my address. And then we don't tell you and we're like, oh, re-enter your card. Like that's just such a bad experience. It's terrible. Yeah. I know they've been working on it for a long time, but I don't think I was even notified or anything of that, that change in the JavaScript stuff. I literally just was poking around the docs the other day and was like, wait, what do you mean? Render the element before creating a payment intent. And I know they have like a change log for API stuff. And like we see the releases of Stripe Ruby, but we just import the Stripe JavaScript. We don't like put it in our package JSON. So it's like... We don't have any time where we see the change log of the JavaScript SDK. So yeah, I'll have to go look at that too, because it sounds like a very welcome change. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited about the embedded checkout. I was like, I can get everything on one page again, instead of having to do it in multiple steps and jump back and forth to the server. So do you use their address stuff or do you like have your own address and then assign it to the Stripe customer billing address? We have our own, I don't think the address element, I think it was in beta or maybe not even announced yet when we started doing checkout. No, I don't think it was yet. Yeah. Yeah, So we would have considered that. So it's our own little form fields. 
but we also yeah. keep like an eternal representation of the billing address so it's fine yeah you'll want that anyways but we, yeah because that address element you can use independently but if you use it tied to a payment intent it doesn't cost money to use because oh, it's built cool. on the google map places api or whatever and so like if you use it just by itself on it like an edit address page then it would cost money but if you like do a update card and billing address in one it's like free or whatever so yeah That's there's some know. interesting little nuances to it but it is convenient it's nice but we did the same thing like we just have an address in our database and then we use that when we create the stripe customer or if it update the stripe customer and so on but it sure be nice not to have to do that because paddle and everything else just takes care of it for us and honestly i like the white label checkout in app but i would really love to just do the checkout so i don't have to mess with any of it that's kind of the, yeah. the dream goal i don't ever foresee myself building my own checkout my side projects like we have to at podia um, right but yeah, yeah, you I mean, want it white labeled in a real product like that, but on side projects like redirecting to Stripe checkout or whatever, like done. I'll embed it now. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Now they don't have to leave my app. Yeah. But yeah. So it, it, it was just nice because I feel like I've been so down on Stripe recently. It was nice to like see that and be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. They're working on a lot of cool stuff. I was in their workbench beta, which is really sweet. It's like a resizable thing at the bottom of your screen that you can open up. It's got the Stripe shell built in and you're already authenticated their API, but it can show you web hooks, recent API requests that were failing and you can drill into those, but you can also just like drop any IDs in there and it will show you all the associations and you can expand those and do all the stuff that you would with the API. So when you're doing development and you're like, trying to figure out the workflow or something for grabbing certain data or whatever, you can just like click around and like visually explore it without having to do it all in like the Rails console and hit mm -hmm. the API manually. It is uh, really, really, really cool. And hopefully it'll come out officially for everybody soon. But my experience in the beta with it was really really good it's just been like so convenient and you're like i wish i had this the whole time looking forward to that they're getting around to making some big improvements i feel like it's just taking time too much time but they're getting there and the paddle api the new paddle billing they must have worked themselves into a corner because paddle classic or whatever is now like a separate product from paddle billing which every new user signs up for and I know the old one is bad, but like it was bad enough that state and status represented the same thing. But if you ask for the API version versus the webhook, one would have status and one would have state and it was the same attribute. And they've like redone the entire freaking product and everything to the point where it's like an, just a whole new version and not compatible with the old version. Like all your old customers stay in the old version. They don't migrate stuff over or whatever. It is one of those times where you're like, they probably should have refactored the whole thing so that they must have worked themselves into a, a tough spot because they were built on Stripe and PayPal, I think. So they had same complexities as we have building on both and trying to support both. But they made some great improvements. Yeah, I'll check it out. That's interesting. Yeah. I know Tailwind and Laravel are big users of them. Yeah, I just pulled up their website and the homepage is like an invoice and it's Tailwind UI as the example. And yeah. Yeah, they have like more expensive pricing, but it's simpler than Stripe's. So it may not actually be more expensive because Stripe can get, you add billing and you add these other little features like Stripe tax or whatever. And then all of a sudden it may be more expensive than this, but it's kind of hard to tell. But they're your option. Maybe Stripe eventually will do merchant of record stuff, but Paddle taking care of like all the sales tax stuff is pretty darn convenient because sales tax is not fun. I don't know enough. Like I know I'm familiar with merchant of record. I'm familiar with, unfortunately, very familiar with the limits, the minimums or whatever to get into thresholds to get into taxes, like in the States yeah, and stuff. Yeah, for different. Yeah. 
somebody was talking though and saying that when you use a merchant of record and you're like a small business, like really small, that because they're acting as the merchant of records, you end up paying taxes in places like you really don't need to yet because Yeah, I was I've talked about that previously, I think. Partially that's because all their products just like always collect sales tax. And I think the reason for that is because they process so much volume. Exactly. That's what it means. Yeah. Because like like, for us, several of our products are like not taxable in states because of it's a platform as a service, which gets tax difference than digital service or whatever, like a generic one in Stripe. And Stripe is accurate for all of our products because we tell it Go Rails is a subscription like Netflix and in Missouri, it doesn't get sales tax or whatever. But if we were to go through Paddle, it's like, we're going to charge sales tax to everybody, no matter what, which is like not le- maybe even legally correct or whatever, but it's, I'm sure we're also on their own safety to like, if we over collect tax, I'm sure the state's not really going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that makes a lot of sense that like, they just do so much volume that they are going to always be They'll meet those the thresholds. taxable thresholds yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, some I just of the never... thresholds are dumb because they're like one payment or a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. And you're like, yeah, but one payment, that could be for five bucks or less. Yeah, these are two counts. different things. Yeah. Yeah. It's insanely complicated sales tax. And it sucks. Especially like going to pay sales tax everybody's website is like very different or they still mail me forms every month and I do them online and <sighs> it's awful. So maybe that's what, I, what will end up being now that Stripe bought tax jar a while back. Maybe they will offer a merchant of record service for you. That'd be cool. What I don't get is when you go through paddle issues, refunds or whatever. So I'm not sure if you have say in that process, of like, hey, customer oh, like requested chargebacks. a refund. Like, does Paddle just go ahead and refund it for me and I don't get a part of the conversation? Or, and then, yeah, also with chargebacks. Like, how do they handle that? I haven't used them for any of that stuff, but chargebacks suck. I hate them. One, a few this past week, but with the fees, our $19 a month thing, $16 fees for any chargeback, whether you win or lose, we, Got like a whole three dollars out of it after winning the chargebacks. And I was like, this this sucks. <laughs> and it's just like these customers could have just emailed me and I would have refunded them and it would have been fine. But right. now I get screwed and they wasted a bunch of time. It's the worst. <sighs> I don't want to get into payments again. Maybe I'll just pretend that payment element thing never happened. Yeah, just ignore it. Yeah. See ya. Just, uh, Details. Later.